Good morning. Good morning. I'm a little, sorry, I'm a little, <laughs> a little disorganized this morning. That's okay though, right? We're all human. We all have those days. I'm going to try to go live. There's my live button on TikTok. We'll just do shamanic coffee hour. I'm going to have to get up and let my dog in in a moment. I just wanted to kind of start on time. So people joining, um, let me go let my dog in. Howdy, howdy, everybody. Three, two, one. Good morning. I see somebody's online. I promise I'm going to get with you. I just, i a little disorganized this morning and I got to let my, got to let my dog in. So hold on just a minute. Oh my goodness, good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Today I'm drinking, I think it's a uh, New England coffee. Um, sorry, somebody was just asking me a question um, on my phone and I'll get back to them in a moment, but welcome. Welcome to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what are we talking about today? We're talking about altered states of consciousness today. One of my favorite topics. I'll tell you why. There's a couple of reasons why it's one of my favorite topics. One is that I practice and teach shamanism, and that involves altered states of consciousness. Two, I'm a certified hypnotherapist. That involves altered states of consciousness. And I just think consciousness is really cool, um, and it's uh, it's a neat thing, you know. It's uh, con our consciousness kind of creates our world, and I think that's uh, I think that's pretty neat the way that works out. So thank you for joining me this morning, and uh, so we're going to talk about altered states. I'm going to talk about how that term can be a little bit of a misnomer as well. Um, talk about why I'm going to talk about um, different ways to alter your state of consciousness. Um, obviously people know, uh, people know of whether you've experienced or not that you can use, you know, drugs and alcohol and things like that to alter your consciousness, but there are plenty of other ways as well. Um, and what are, what are states of consciousness? How do we know what a state of consciousness is? So per usual, I'm going to kind of define my terms. I'm going to, um, figure out if, um, figure out what I'm talking about. Gosh, I'm sorry, people are like, this is such a weird disorganized morning for me. Um, my apologies. People are texting me, people are asking me questions, notifications are popping up. So, but welcome if you're just joining and uh, lots of people joining this morning, we're talking about altered states of consciousness. Um, so let's talk about what consciousness is. Consciousness is very hard to define. Scientists have a hard time with it. Um, the last sort of scientific explanation or definition of consciousness I heard was um, it is first person subjective experience. Okay, you know, um, and experience is, experience is important um, because the way I view consciousness, it is a field, a you know, a field, not like a field, but a field in which experience arises. It is our ability to be aware of it. You know, consciousness comes with the ability to be aware of experience arising. That's it. That's as, you know, that's as close as I can get. Other than that, it's, it's pretty challenging. And there are times when we think we are unconscious, right? I had somebody um, on a podcast the other day who was like, I, you know, I hit my head and I went away and I don't know what happened. How can you explain that? How can you explain consciousness? And I'm like, well, when you awoke, you were still there, right? So there was a continuity of consciousness. There's just a gap in the time in which your brain was receiving consciousness. And by the way, 
Um, not even science today thinks that consciousness is located in, or most science. I mean, I can't say science. People say science says um, science is not one field. It's a method of inquiry. But but um, we cannot pin consciousness down to electrical activity in the brain. They have not been able to do that so far. Consciousness is considered a really challenging problem in science whether it's cognitive science or you know neurobiology or whatever it's a really really hard thing to pin down we can't localize it it appears to be non-local um and i love to quote the the quantum uh physicist erwin schrodinger who said the number of consciousnesses in the universe is one right so from my view and the view of some spiritual belief systems there is one consciousness, you might call it God or source or Brahman or whatever, and we individuate from that. But there's one giant field of consciousness that we're all a part of, and we can we can learn to tap into that by altering our consciousness. Um, so this is how th you know people can do things like remote viewing and uh, telepathy and all of these things. And by the way, um, you know, you might think, even if you think like ESP and telepathy and remote viewing, you know, all that stuff is hogwash. Um, it's been shown in, you know, the the effect of it has been shown in laboratory experiments for decades beyond statistical probability, well beyond statistical probability, right? And um, so, you know, believe, believe what you want, but science does not disprove um, yeah, there, you know, with unfortunately, with a lot of spiritual phenomena over the years, there has been a lot of tomfoolery and trickery and people trying to put one over on other people. And um, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that all of it is right. That doesn't mean that every effect can be explained away by trickery or uh, something else. Okay, we have proven with, you know, um, the, Dean Radin's done some amazing work on the effect of consciousness on physical systems. You know, some amazing, you know, beyond, well, they've run billions of trials using these, um, you know, uh, nuclear, not nuclear, but they're atomic, basically, um, random number generators. So they use a physical process to generate random numbers and consciousness can affect them. How? We don't know but we know it happens and we know it happens beyond uh you know one in a trillion bit of probability anyway, if you you know if you look at most scientific um studies you know if they get within you know 99% of uh confidence in a study that's a pretty good study right 99.9% .9 confidence means that, you know, there's a 0.1% chance that the results happen um, just out of pure chance, right? There's always, a, there's always like, you know, if you're studying medication, for example, and you give somebody a pill and it make, and, and they get better, that doesn't necessarily prove causation. Um, you've got to do lots and lots of uh, studies with large numbers of things. Well, because they're using these quantum computers, these not quantum, but they're using these um, computers that use physical processes, they can run billions of trials and have been doing it over decades. And so the statistical probability that their results are, are random or just a matter of chance is astronomical, better than almost any study on anything that's ever been run. And it shows the effect of consciousness on physical processes. So you can check out, you can check out like Dean Radin, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, the Pair Lab. Um, you can check out the, you know, ran, random number um, experiments. They've done them uh, in all kinds, of, they've shown them to be affected by global consciousness, especially. So when something goes on that everybody's paying attention to, and one example of that is they they take samples, they run these generators, they generate ones and zeros, and 
it should, if, you know, they're, they're physically random. So it should generate an equal, you know, if you run it a billion times, you should have a, half a billion ones, half a billion zeros with some amount of shift based on just random chance, right? Some amount of shift. It won't be exactly that ever. But if you run a billion trials, it'll be close enough to that that you won't be off. Well, they can show a statistically significant change, a reduction in randomness when events affecting global consciousness happens, things like 9-11, things like Princess Diana's funeral, things, you know, stuff like that. They can show this really global uh, effect of consciousness on these machines that they've placed all over the world. They start all simultaneously behaving less randomly. And it is, again, it's a physical random number generator. So they, it's consciousness affecting physical processes. And there's virtually no way that that is happening by random chance based on um, statistics. So scientific certainty to the degree that we can get it. Um, so our consciousness affects our world. And I would say that our consciousness really creates our world. There isn't anything that you experience that's not happening inside your consciousness, right? As I speak to you, um, if you're hearing me or maybe you're reading the subtitles of the recording later or whatever, it's just energy waves hitting your sense organs, right? Uh, sound waves, light waves hitting your sense organs. And those are changed into electrical signals that go somewhere into your brain. But in your brain, arises an experience of a person speaking to you, right? You have a subjective experience of a person speaking to you. And the words that I use, the words that I choose have an effect on your mind, right? Whether you accept them or reject them, how do they make you feel, whether they make you think anything, right? So that's consciousness. And consciousness to me is a true miracle. People look for people look for miracles. People look for you know these extraordinary things to happen, miraculous healing and miraculous appearances of spirit and all of these things. And you know those things happen, but our day to day consciousness, because we live in it, we're like fish swimming in the water, not being aware of the water. We live in our consciousness. And it's it's pretty amazing. So consciousness cannot be confined to the brain. What I think about consciousness and the brain is that the brain is a receiver of, con it's a transceiver of consciousness. It's like a radio. And this, I promise, I'm going to relate to altered states in a moment. So the brain is like a radio receiver. It's like the radio in your car. In your car, at any given moment, if your radio is turned off, it's unconscious or on, it's conscious. Um, it's usually tuned to a very narrow band on the radio. And you might be listening to music or talk radio or something else or static. Um, but every signal from every source of radio waves on the planet and away from the planet exist in your car simultaneously. It's all there, but you are tuned to such a narrow band of it, of electromagnetic radiation, that you're picking up, you know, if you're tuned into a station, you are picking up the strongest signal that is broadcasting on that, near that um, frequency, right? Um, but every radio station is available. And the brain is the same way. The brain is picking up on a very specific frequency of consciousness. We experience this physical, or we, in shamanism, we call it ordinary reality, our day-to-day -day wakeful reality that we're experiencing. It's, it's here for us all to experience. Um, and we can talk about consensus reality in a minute. I don't think, like, no two people agree on reality. No two people agree, you know, on everything in reality it just doesn't happen because we're different our brains are different we have different receipt we have different radios in our heads so in your radio you can tune you can turn the dial right and the dial changes to a different station i was listening to pop music and now i'm listening to country music 
Now, this, you know, when we say, oh, I changed the stations. But all I did was I changed the configuration of the radio, right? I changed the frequency that it was tuned to. Well, we can do the same thing with our brains. And we can tune into different frequencies of realities. We might call them parallel realities or alternate universes or whatever. Um, we can tune our brain. In fact, our brain tunes itself pretty often. Right. And we would call this, we would call this an altered state. But again, I think that's a little bit, it can be a little bit misleading. And here's why. Our state of mind and what we are attuned to changes constantly throughout the day. Sometimes we can change that significantly. Like when we go from a waking to a sleep state, or we go into a state of deep hypnosis, or we go into a state of deep meditation. And we generally refer to that as an altered state. But we have these um, circadian rhythms. If you've ever gotten like sleepy in the afternoon, or if you've ever found yourself daydreaming, you are in an altered state of consciousness. One way to look at this from a physical perspective, and this is not the only way, is that our brain waves actually change patterns, right? So there are these different, based on the, the predominant frequencies of our brain waves, our brain, you know, cycles and waves, just like radio signals. This is why the, you know, the radio analogy is pretty good. Um, and people will tell you that normally we're in this state uh, called beta, which is, you know, when we're wakeful consciousness or whatever. We go into a daydreaming or a relaxed state or a light state of meditation, we may go into what's called an alpha state. And that's our brain waves start to slow down. Um, below that is a state called theta, which I think is like four to seven cycles per second, meaning that it's like every second there's four little bumps in the wave, right? In theta, we have, it seems to be, from the research that I've read and done and all that, it seems to be that there's a tremendous amount of information available to us. And most, um, they have done tests with um, psychics, people who do psychic readings and that sort of thing, and rated their um, predictions and things for accuracy. And when they are showing predominantly theta wave states, they are, their accuracy jumps way higher. Um, I do know there's a lot of brainwave research. Here's a book, as a matter of fact, that has, shows a lot of great brainwave research. It's called Soul Matters. It might show up backwards to you because screen is screen is made by Jean Rochelle Salomon, who is actually a um, peer of my shamanic teacher and is a shamanic teacher, but this is her PhD research on um using quantum EEG meters. And um the the uh what it shows is that people shamanic practitioners go into a theta state as well although it's there's more to it than that it has to not just do with the predominant brain waves but also which areas of the brain are more active than others so here's a question um sometimes when i do deeper meditation i believe my state of consciousness changes because my dogs react undoubtedly i get really dizzy and i have to stop do you think it's related to states of consciousness um, it could be, but it can also be related to your physical state. So the brain and the body are not separate things. Um, and so it may be that there are lots of reasons why you might be becoming dizzy. Um, your breathing pattern might be changed significantly. Your, um, your, you know, vagus nerve might be affected. Your, um, your blood sugar might drop, interestingly enough. So your brain... Your brain uses about 25% of your blood glucose. So, you know, this three pound organ in your body uses uh, more than its fair share of the energy in your body. And sometimes when we are doing stuff in meditation or whatever, I find this true with shamanic practice, like um, journeying a lot, a lot of shamanic journeying will make me incredibly hungry, right? Got to refill those, those stocks. So there's a number of reasons why you might get dizzy and stop. Um, you might also be dissociating, so you might be floating outside of your body, but yeah, it can be related to altered consciousness, but it can also be related to physical processes. 
Um, if you are getting physical symptoms frequently from meditation and other things, definitely get checked out, like have your blood sugar checked and, and that sort of thing. I'm not a doctor, can't give medical advice, but um, it can be due to altered state in which you are losing touch with your body. And that happens in shamanic journey. Although I don't generally get dizzy from that. Um, so you are welcome. Um, but yeah, physical effects, I would, uh, you know, if it's concerning, definitely get it checked out by a doctor, or have a, you know, get your blood sugar checked, make sure you're not hypoglycemic or anything like that. Um, it could be a blood, blood pressure drops are also associated with dizziness. So it could be that you're relaxing so much that your blood pressure is, is, is dropping, um, too rapidly or something. So there's all, all kinds of stuff that can happen there. So. Um, so the things that we refer to as altered states tend to be more profound than just we're daydreaming, right? There's no, not a really good definition of an altered state other than it's like, it's not your normal waking state, but we don't necessarily have a normal waking state. We might feel that way because we don't pay attention to what our consciousness is doing throughout the day, but you could be, um, one, you know, you could be working on something and become hyper-focused right? Or you could be out in nature and all of a sudden your focus widens out, you know, and this isn't that, you know, this isn't a significant, sometimes not a significant enough shift from your everyday, whatever you consider your everyday consciousness that you're like, oh, I'm in an altered state. But meditation will put you there. Shamanic journey will put you there. Listening to music can put you into an altered state. For sure. That's why we listen to music. We listen to music to alter our state. What is it altering? It's altering our emotions, which are, you know, emotions are complex things. Um, but also it can alter our, you know, certain rhythms and certain things like certain music makes you want to dance. Certain music makes you want to cry. Certain music makes you, you know, um, music is amazing. And it, and it looks like you know, um, humans, they have found like really, really, really old tens of thousands of years, year old, um, flutes made out of animal bones and stuff. So people have been making music forever. It appears to be an important part of our evolutionary path that we, we make music. It's part of our humanity. So that's a, it's a lovely thing. Um, So, uh, what was I saying? Um, altered consciousness. I, I went into an altered state for a moment. So our consciousness changes throughout the day. It changes when we sleep. Most people who, if you've taken a basic psychology class and they've talked about sleep, we have sleep cycles, right? We have, you know, cycles where our brain's really active and our eyes are moving. It's called REM or rapid eye movement sleep. And then sometimes we drop down into what are called delta brain waves or brain waves are barely perceptible. They're low frequency and low amplitude. It's really, really deep sleep. We usually, usually don't remember anything during that, that level. Does that mean we're un, unconscious, right? Does it mean that consciousness goes away? It just means that our brain is not tuned to a level of consciousness that is, is very, very altered, but you can still wake people up from a deep sleep, meaning part of their brain is paying attention. Part of the brain is aware. It just might not be something you remember. Right. So, um, sorry, I'm going to have another sip of coffee. Today I'm drinking New England Coffee Roasters Donut Shop Blend. I think when they say Donut Shop Blend, they want it to mean like it's supposed to be like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Um, Dunkin' Donuts is a New England obsession. I got, yesterday there was an interesting, there was a photo that somebody posted on Facebook that they, um, it is, it was a picture of people, a bunch of people on horseback waiting in, in Maine, in Corinth, Maine, waiting at a, waiting in line at a Dunkin' Donuts drive through It was about seven people on horses and in line. People take it very, Dunkin' Donuts very seriously around here. Um, this does not taste like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I don't really like Dunkin' Donuts coffee all that much, but, um, I'll drink it if it's the only thing available, but I don't think it's, but people are flipping obsessed with it. Got to have their 
got to have their donkeys. You know, like in other places in the country, they're obsessed with Starbucks. And we have Starbucks here too, but not as many. When I lived in Massachusetts, um, within a quarter of a mile of my house, there were six, six Dunkin' Donuts. That's how much, that's how obsessed people are. It's, it's, the chain is actually from Massachusetts, um, but it's very popular in New England. And I know people who are like, live in Florida that don't have Dunkin' Donuts near them. And then like the first thing they do when they come up here is like, go to Dunkin' Donuts. I'm like, why? <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't want to just bash on Dunkin' Donuts, um, but um, it's just not my, it's just not my thing. I just don't really like it all that much. So altered states, what are some ways that, good morning. Oh, your Wi-Fi is a mess. I'm sorry. Hoping to stay on. Um, so here's my tech nerd coming out. Um, uh, my tech nerd, my tech nerdiness coming out is, um, uh, you don't have to do it now, obviously, but, um, try recycling your Wi-Fi, like unplugging it and plugging it back in and maybe it'll get better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. As many Dunkin' Donuts as you do waffle houses. Yeah. Yeah. Probably more. Um, because not only will you have Dunkin' Donuts, like standalone Dunkin' Donuts, but they will be inside. So there's Dunkin' Donuts inside Walmart here. So most Walmarts in the state will have a Dunkin' Donuts in them. And when I lived in Boston, um, the train stations all had Dunkin' Donuts in them. So you would have standalone Dunkin' Donuts, and then you would have, um, you would have, uh, uh, Dunkin', like these little stands inside all of the subway stations. So. Um, you are welcome. Yeah. Try recycling your router. That might, that might help. That's my little, I'm also, besides talking about altered states of consciousness, I'm handing out technical advice today. <laughs> so if anybody has any tech questions, uh, post them. Um, I'll do what I can. I don't know. Can't always. Um, so what are some ways that we alter our state of consciousness? Um, for many people, music alters consciousness. In fact, in shamanism, we use rhythm, specific rhythms to alter our consciousness. The brain does something frequently that we call entrainment, meaning like the, the, uh, pattern of brain activity begins to mimic a rhythm and that changes our consciousness significantly. And, um, so music is one way. Sex can, if you're doing it right, alters our consciousness, right? So there are lots of ways. So that's, you know, brain rhythms, um, hormones, you know, good feeling hormones, bad feeling hormones, uh, emotion, meditation alters our consciousness. Um, certain types of prayer, people go into prayer. So being in a, being in a sacred space that, that, um, is awe inspiring can alter your consciousness. I can remember, like, if you think about a place that you've been to, that you've been in awe over. So for me as a kid, I was 10 and, and, uh, going to the Grand Canyon, going to Niagara Falls. And these places are, are, you know, when you're, when you're 10 and you grew up in the woods in Maine, um, you know, I, and I still love, I can be in awe in the woods for sure. I can be in the awe, in, in awe in nature. So things that inspire awe can significantly alter your consciousness as well. Um, going into the cathedral, the Dom, as they say in Cologne, Germany, or Köln, Germany, and it's, you know, 700 years old and still under construction, and has walls that are 16 feet thick and it's i don't know 300 feet high and it, it, you walk in and it's like a dark cave and they have reliquaries there that supposedly hold the bones of the three wise men and um just you know the candles burning and you're just like in this you know medieval thing this that's been built for somebody like and yes it's a it's a you know it's a holy place to people who are I think I'm pretty sure it's ca still Catholic um, to people who are Catholic or whatever, but it's still awe inspiring. It's still, you know, profoundly changed. My, besides, it's like incredibly dark. And so sensory things can alter your consciousness. Our senses can alter our consciousness. If you've ever been in a float tank, 
sensory deprivation tank. It's uh, I've done that a few times, and it's quite a, quite an amazing experience. Um, recommend it if you can handle it. Um, some people cannot. Some people they're too anxious or have you know something come up while they're in there. Uh, for me, it's like um, I wind up um, when I've done when I've done float tanks and I've done them with another person. So you can do, um, uh, there's a, there's a place in Maine here called float harder. Um, it's an interesting name. It's a very cool place. Highly recommended if you're in the area, um, and you want to do a float. Um, but they do have a room where couples can go in. I mean, you don't have to be a couple, but you're both naked. So <laughs> you got to be really friendly with the other person or at least, you know, comfortable in it. And I've done that and it's been a profound, experience a profoundly deep experience um where you're you know you're both floating in body temperature water that's full of um it's full of epsom salt so you float you don't have to there's no muscles um pressure and the room is it's not completely dark it you know it's not complete sensory deprivation but it's it's dark end and your eyes are closed and they'll, they'll play sounds through there if you want the thunderstorm sounds or whatever um because complete sensory deprivation, most people can only take 20 minutes of that or something. So, but I, you know, floated for like an hour and I find it profoundly altering, um, particularly floating with another person. I think, you know, if I, if I had to guess, um, we're syncing up. There's a really interesting, um, there's a bunch of really interesting things about um, people's heart rates getting in sync when they're they're close. Your heart, um, your heart gives off, uh, or you know, electromagnetism, right? It's an elect. There's lots of, uh, you know, the nerves in your heart give off a lot of electricity. Um, you know, an electrical signal that can be detected through walls using, you know, they have equipment. The military has equipment that they can tell if somebody's inside a building. You know, if they're, and you know, they use it not just for like trying to find, find people to shoot or whatever, but to like if somebody's in a collapsed building or something, they can tell if there's um, somebody alive in there with this really sensitive equipment that can detect heart. Um, the heart, the heart gives off an electrical signal many times, many times more powerful than the brain. And when people are in sync, they have found that their heart rates and their heart rhythms actually start to um, synchronize. So it's a really cool thing. So I think probably the brain does very similar things. If you've ever been in meditation with other people, you know, it's good to meditate alone, but if you've ever sat in meditation with a group or if you've done um, shamanic journey circles, it is incredibly powerful. You get sort of carried on the same wave as a way to describe it. Um, and I think like, I don't want to reduce it only to physical processes. I just find that part of it really interesting. And I'm not, um, you know, I am not, uh, I'm not an expert in electromagnetism or anything like that. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I can only speak a little bit about it from, you know, studies I've read and things like that. And this is, um, this book soul matters is if you're interested at all in shamanism and you're interested at all in brain research. Um, this is a really interesting one. There's lots of, it's good for guys like me. There's lots of pictures of like EEG results and stuff and lots of case studies. It's pretty academic. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's pretty cool. Like we, we talk about the heart and in, um, so in, in Japanese, uh, the word for heart is, um, shin, right? But it's also the word for um, spirit, and it's also the word for mind, right? So the heart, in most cultures, the heart is like almost the, the seed of consciousness, at least the seed of emotion. And we talk about giving somebody your heart, you know, falling in love. It's an affair of the heart or, you know, whatever, right? We talk about the heart as this um, organ of consciousness. Um and consciousness, I don't think, is so as as brain centric as we make it out to be, right? Like um, we know that most of our serotonin, for example, is produced in our gut, and we find um, neuropeptides in every almost 
I, th I think almost every cell or every cell in our body. So there's a lot going on there. And again, I don't want to reduce consciousness just simply to physical processes, but I do find that stuff really, really interesting. Um, so consciousness appears to be non-local. There are non-local effects of consciousness. So in some of these studies where consciousness affects physical things, things that we observe, so, so um, observer ex observer effect has been measured in quantum science experience. Um, what I mean by non-local, it mean I mean that you know being aware of something or observing something can change a physical system. So normally in classic Newtonian physics, for me to have an effect on a physical system, I have to physically interact with it, right? I'm lifting my coffee cup. And that can be that action can be described pretty accurately with Newtonian physics. I'm applying this many pounds of pressure in this direction. And so the cup moves in that direction, right? Um, so Newton's laws of motion are, are accurate for predicting things like how things move and how planets, you know, for example, he had to invent calculus for that to figure that out. Um, what a guy, right? Newton, Isaac Newton, um, you know, created the, figured out the law of gravity. Um, before before Newton figured out gravity, some people used to think that that um, things fell towards the earth because they love because the earth loved them and they were in love with the earth. I don't think that's a bad necessarily a bad uh, metaphor, but um, you know, now we know that mass creates a curve in space time and that causes things to fall towards heavier things um, or things with more mass. Um, but, you know, um, Newton figured that out and he figured out laws of motion. And here's the thing about Isaac Newton, right? So he was a physicist. Um, I mean, we didn't have the word physics back then. We didn't even have the word science back then. Um, in his time, he was considered what they call a natural philosopher. Natural philosophy became science um, sometime after or during the Renaissance. Um, I guess it would have been after, uh, after the Renaissance, but there was a lot of work on scientific method then. Um, but Isaac Newton was also, um, besides figuring out all these physical laws and stuff, he was an alchemist. So he had an alchemical lab in his house and he was trying to plumb the depths of reality, of physical reality, of spiritual reality. Um, and he believed that the, the fact that the universe worked like a machine, clockwork, using predictable laws like the law of gravity, the laws of motion, you know, that sort of thing, um, that it was proof of divinity. Because how could the universe be so ordered and work according to really, really specific laws? If any of the laws of physics were slightly different, so if the law of gravity behaved slightly different, was off by some tiny, tiny fraction of a percent, or the forces of that hold the nuclei of atoms together were slightly off, the entire universe would fly apart. There would be no physical universe as we experience it has to be extremely precise, right? That to me is pretty amazing. I mean, I don't, you know, believe what you believe, but that is just, is pretty amazing that we are able to live in a, in a physical universe that exists and that we're able to experience it through our consciousness, which appears to be non-local. Now, you know, as somebody who practices shamanism, I experience non-local consciousness every day. When I'm working with clients or I'm working with students, I am essentially leaving my body behind for a period of time and going out and getting information or working with uh, working with spirits. And the way that I like to explain that, um, you know, if you were paying attention, if you were here in the beginning, not paying attention, but if you were tuned in the beginning, I talked about it sort of like tuning a radio in your car is that I'm, you know, tuning my consciousness to another realm, another frequency. And that is, that's sort of the, you know, shamanic skills are there, right? That's, that's what shamanic skills are. They teach you to alter your consciousness, to be able to perceive different things, to be able to work with spirits. This isn't to say that 
you know, in an, in an unaltered state, well, I think you have to be slightly altered to experience spirits, um, you know, to visual, to see them anyway. Um, in my, you know, in my view, in my reality, in my experience, and yours might be different, we are constantly surrounded by spirits, not just deceased people, but there are spirits of nature and spirits of place. And this is very real for many, many cultures, for many, many cultures. So I have a list somewhere in my computer, in my <laughs> very disorganized um, uh, files, files in my computer. I have a list of over 200 names for what you might call little people or the fae from different cultures. So all of these disparate cultures all over the world, cultures that haven't had any contact with one another, um, at least not for tens of thousands of years, all have stories of what we might in English call fairies or the fae or little people. In Hawaii, they're called menahune. In, um, you know, they're called, uh, in throughout the British Isles, there are many different names for them. Uh, green coats, uh, brownies in Germany of kobolds and um, Scandinavia, you've got elves and dwarves and um, trolls and, you know, all of these. We, and just in shamanism, we call them nature spirits, right? They're strongly associated with nature. Um, but these, these are not, um, you know, we, we use the word fairy tales in, in English to refer to things that are fabricated or not true, but the fae, very real and very part of the faith of many different cultures. You know, in Iceland, for example, there's something like 25% of um, the population of Iceland believe in elves. You know, and I personally have, um, I personally have had, even before I started training in shamanism, I had some very weird experiences with um, beings that I can only consider spiritual. So I'll tell you a story. I, I will give you a short story to illustrate. And um, one of the, th you know, one of the things that I always look to is, you know, if I'm the only, if I have some, these days, I don't question a lot of my experiences because I've had too many to start to question them. I still question them. Is this real? Am I making this up? Am I imagining this? Is this wishful thinking, whatever. But if I have an experience and like multiple people experience the same thing or close enough to the same thing, that's usually an indication that it's not my brain making something up. So many years ago, like, I don't know, like uh, 25 or more years ago, um, I was training in martial arts in Boston. And my, um, my school was in the basement of this building in Boston and I was working out and it was just me and one other guy, my friend Jimmy, um, training together in the dojo area. And so there was um, the do there was a, a you know a stairway that came down to a hallway and the dojo was off to one side. And then there was there were there was like an office space and like a gym in the back uh, of that. And so Jimmy and I were in the dojo space and my my teacher, my sensei was in the office, which had a view of the hallway. So I'm training with my friend, Jimmy, and the way that we train your, your consciousness, your, you do go into a little bit of an altered state as you're training, as you're doing these repetitive motions over and over again. And, um, and so people have dreams and experiences based on their beliefs, not evidence, you know, fiction. Okay. You know, um, if you want to look at it that way, that's fine. Um, but I'm talking about an experience of consensus reality here. And yes, everybody's everybody's experiences are filtered through their belief system and through their through their filters. Um, fiction means something is not true. Having an you know, and that is an argument for another day. But um, making something up is fiction. Experiencing something, maybe not, maybe not. So um, it's very challenging to have such a closed impoverished belief system that anything that is outside of my experience is fiction. Um, that's a very challenging way to go, th <laughs> go throughout life and in the world. Um, 
So I'm training with my friend Jimmy, and I see, this is going to sound really weird, but I see this little man about two feet tall, greenish in color, run through the room and through the back wall. And I have no, um, no way to make any sense out of this. Like, I, I don't understand what I've just seen. And I stopped. And my friend Jimmy says, did you just see that? And I said, what did you see? He said, well, I saw this little man run through the room and through the back of a, the school. I'm like, I saw the same thing. And we kind of described him. It was green. He's about this tall. He's wearing this. He's at this hat, you know, whatever. And um, my teacher who had been, you know, in his office and had a view of the hallway comes in a couple minutes later and says, what happened to your little friend that just came running through here? So three people had seen three people had seen the same thing. You know, was that a real experience? Was it fiction? I wasn't making it up. I'm not making it up now. I have no reason to make it up. I didn't even have an explanation for it at the time. Like I was completely confused about it. It had nothing to do with my belief system. I definitely did not believe in little people at that time in my life. Um, it took a lot of convincing for me to get there. Um, and that wasn't the, you know, that was not the only experience that I had to have for that to, for that to be true. Um, so it's a question. Do you think people who are naturally more psychic, who perceive things in their day-to-day -day life, have a different set of brain leaves? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that's possible. I think that, um, again, so throughout the day, we have these rhythms, we have these sort of circadian rhythms where we naturally go into, you know, alpha states when we're daydreaming or zoning out or whatever. And, um, you know, some people may drop into theta states, right? So very slow, four to seven cycles per second brain waves. And during those times may have an opportunity to be more perceptive, but I don't know that. It's just a thought. It's just a, you know, it'd be really interesting to, um, I, I don't know that you could, uh, you know, hook somebody up all day long <laughs> to <laughs> equipment to measure, now, but EEGs have become much more um, portable. It used to be like, they'd have to strap you into this huge thing and you'd be tethered. Um, now they have EEGs that are, you know, they're still, it's like wearing a bicycle helmet and their, their wireless connection to the um, computer that is receiving the, the signals and can record them. So maybe, maybe we could do, um, maybe we could do an experiment at some point. Um, I don't know, but that, that is a theory that, you know, would make sense to me if, if that panned out. So, um, so was I in an altered state when I, uh, encountered this little being? Um, yeah, I think I was, I think I was slightly altered, but I, I don't know about the other people that, that were with me, but we all saw it. We all experienced it. We all experienced the same thing. Um, I've been out in the desert and seen beings that I don't have an explanation for that, you know, 20, 30 other people saw at the same time. Um, I've been in a, um, sweat lodge uh before and experienced beings that other people in the sweat lodge saw so you know i don't i don't have an explanation for um consensus reality like that that is outside other than we're either perceiving something that is that is real but but not necessarily real in this ordinary reality so we're perceiving things that are outside of this ordinary reality. Um, or somehow we are all sinking to the same dream state or something like something in our something in our imagination, like our imaginations are sinking up somehow, which is would also be very, very cool um, if that were occurring. But I've had I've seen um, I've seen physical effects from spirit uh, that have been witnessed by 20 other people. So. Um, I had there were I had some incidents that were happening years ago when I was going through my training in shamanism. Um, I had a bunch of weird things happening, stuff disappearing, reappearing, strange things, strange sounds, whatever. And um, I was taking a class from a teacher, not my main teacher, but another teacher. I was taking a class 
um, with her. And I went in and I'm like, look, uh, all of this stuff is happening to me. My stuff is disappearing and the reappearing in weird places and this and that. And she said, I don't think that that's really happening. I think you are witnessing this, but like, I think somebody in your house is moving your stuff and you're not, you know, you're just not picking up on it or whatever. And I said, uh, I kind of thought, well, no, I'm pretty sure there was nobody else in my house when my stuff disappeared and reappeared somewhere else, but whatever. Um, and so we're training, we're in training, this shamanic training, and we're sitting in this really smaller circle. We all kind of gathered in the center of the room and the teacher's demonstrating something. And so all my stuff is about 10 feet behind me. So it's like my, I have a backpack or it's actually a, a drum bag, a drum bag with my drum. My rattle is sitting out, my notebook with my notes I'm taking, my water bottle, all that stuff is behind me, about 10 feet behind me. And we're sitting almost touching the person next to us in a kind of a tight circle, just watching, observing my teacher teaching something. And my rattle starts shaking behind me. Um, audibly, you can hear it. I, you know, I hear it and I turn around and I see the rattle shaking on its own. And the woman next to me, um, turns around, um, and pardon my French that says, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and I look and I go, yeah, that's my rattle. And, um, so the teachers, everybody in the room witnessed it, everybody, there were 20 people there and including the teacher, um, witnessed this rattle shaking on its own. The, the, the room was not moving. There was not wind blowing. There was no earthquake. Nobody else's rattle was shaking. Everybody had a rattle. Nothing else in the room was shaking or moving. Nobody was walking across the floor. So there was no ordinary explanation for that. And then it put it in the context with everything else that was going on around me. Lots of weirdness, high weirdness. So at the, after the class, after that day's class, um, a teacher comes up to me. She goes, okay, you know, I saw the rattle. Okay, this is really going on with you. There's something really, really strange happening here, you know, going on. I'm like, yeah, I told you. Um, it was pretty funny. So I did a, um, you know, a couple years ago now, I think I did a, I was interviewed on a radio show out of Pittsburgh um, by these people who are paranormal investigators, right? These are, you know, ghost hunters. They go into places that are reportedly haunted and try to gather physical evidence. They, you know, record things and I'm not sure exactly the process, but they try to get things on video and audio and that sort of thing. So they're looking for ghosts. So I told that story because I thought it was a funny one, a funny paranormal story. Like it still kind of cracks me up to this day. And um, uh, the the people on the, you know, the, the main host of the radio is like, Oh my gosh, you must be so scared. That's unbelievable. How would you, how could you, that not totally freak you out? I'm like, how could that freak you out? Like you guys are looking for this stuff. Like it happened to me. You guys are looking They're like, well, you know, something non-physical can move things around. I'm like, so what, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, it's not harming me. And even if it is, you know, non-physical moving my stuff, I'm more likely to be harmed by getting hit by a car or something like that. Like, be be afraid of the right things <laughs> be afraid I, I have a very um I, I have a master's degree in information security so i think in terms of risk like what things are are higher risk than others so just something being you know paranormal or spooky doesn't make something higher risk to me so i'm not necessarily afraid of it um but it was kind of a funny story and on the um on the radio broadcast, part of the group of paranormal researchers was somebody who's a medium. Um, and if you don't know, mediums are people who generally naturally, I mean, you can learn mediumship, but most people are born into it. And mediums naturally can see or and or communicate with spirits. And um, uh, there, this woman was a medium. I'm like, well, you're a medium, right? She's like, yeah. And I said, uh, so, you know, like we live in a crowded world, like we're surrounded by spirit all the time. And she's like, oh yeah, all the time. So I'm like, well, why are, you know, these, why are these guys freaked out by spirits? Like, yeah, it's hard sometimes to get physical evidence. I want to talk a little bit about that too. Um, so one of the ways that I explain uh, different planes of existence, and I, I know like there are there are models now in quantum physics of parallel universes and all of those things and, and multiple realities. Um, so 
I'm going to talk about these frequencies. You can also think of it as like layers, right? So we're at this very gross layer at the bottom. I don't mean gross like disgusting. I mean gross like physical, like we have mass here in this world, right? There's physical objects. Very heavy down here. It's vibrating at a, at a, we could say it's vibrating at a lower frequency. But stacked on top of that are these other layers. And they're not exactly, you know, they're not exactly completely parallel. There are areas where they warp and cross over, where the frequencies actually cross each other. Like there are places on Earth um, where you're more likely to, where, you know, and people who are mediums or whatever might say, oh, there are places in the world. I don't know what's going on here. There are places in the world where the veil is thinner. Um, you know, where, where realities, you know, you're much more likely to have a spiritual experience. Um, and there are people who do things to personally, to thin the veil in certain, certain areas, um, a little beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today. Um, but, uh, my, my TikTok, I don't know how to stuff happens on TikTok. I don't know how to deal with it. I got to figure out TikTok. I got to get my kids to teach me TikTok someday. I don't know how to use all the controls on TikTok. Um, swipe left for this, swipe right for that. Click on this, click on that. Um, so there are areas where the those, those um, sheets of plastic, right? So if you remember um, old, like uh, old books of anatomy for our good example, where you had like you had a, a picture of the bones, and then there was a plastic overlay of the of the muscles that you could overlay on the bones, and maybe on top of that or underneath that or whatever was a picture of the organs, and then on top of that was the skin, and so you could like lay these things over each other, or like old overhead projectors. If you're my age and you grew up in the Stone Age, where teachers were projecting things and had plastic sheets, nowadays all the classrooms, at least in my kids' school, have. Um, you know, they project things onto monitors. Uh, but we used to have, you know, a physical projector and there was a plastic screen on there and they, you could write on it or overlay pieces of plastic. So this is sort of like the different layers of reality, but they're not completely flat and they do interpenetrate and interact. In some places, things, the, the distance between those cl closes or the, the veil is thinner or they're closer in frequency. And so you're more likely to have, um, spiritual or paranormal experiences there. There are places that will alter your consciousness um, because you will start to entrain to the reality that, that you're in there. And there are people who are trying to um, bring more magic into the world by creating uh, areas of thinner veil, we'll put it that way. Um, uh, which is cool or frightening, depending on how you view it. Um, and so there are, you know, there are places that frighten us and there are places that make us feel really good. And there are places so we kind of attune, attune to this. Um, so those, those layers kind of exist in the same physical space. And so some spiritual beings, their home, like our home is on this plane. Um, but our, parts of us exist on higher higher or different layers right so our mind can explore different layers our consciousness can explore different layers we have a higher self there are in different cultures there are um multi-part models of the soul in western esotericism you have you know you have a physical body you have an energy body you have an astral body you have a causal body these are subtler goes from gross to more and more subtle that's one model of looking at it there are many many different models of looking at this um but i like sort of i sort of like that layered model we're like russian nesting dolls where the outer layer is our physical body and then we get more and more subtle as we go in or the other way around however you want to look at it so there there are places where this is thinner and in our physical world overlaps and inter is interpenetrated with these spiritual realities and there are realities that are so far removed from our spirit from our from our normal physical reality that um, they don't cross over very much, um, you know, and so we have to 
we would have to do spiritual work to sort of attain those. And there's a good good model for that in Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, which um, either views things as a tree. So like we're down here at the bottom of the tree in this sphere called Malkuth. And as we go up the tree, things get more and more subtle till eventually you reach this field of endless light called Ein Sof Ur. Um, and I may be mispronouncing that. I don't speak Hebrew, so I apologize um, if I'm mispronouncing anything. Uh, so that's one model. Or another model that also comes from Kabbalah is um, uh, these uh, spheres, right? So that comes in. There are also these um, spheres or planes in Enochian systems. There are spheres or planes. So there are lots of different models of how to describe this, right? We're trying to take a, so, you know, we live in a 3D world. We could imagine the fourth dimension being time, but it's not really, um, time is an aspect of our 3D world, but we, we live in a 3D world and these planes are other dimensions. So we can't really perceive those, but we're trying to reduce that down to a two-dimensional image. Um, there's a, oh gosh, I cannot remember the name of the book, but there's a there's a great book that is um, so simple that even like a kid could read it and understand it, at describing planes of ex planes of existence in in um, terms of physics, right? So I think it's called like Flat Edward or something like that. And so you imagine you're a being living in a two in living in two dimensions, right? You're living on a flat surface. And if you encounter, like you had another, a, a being that's a circle and you encountered that being and you're a square, you would both kind of seem like from your perspective, you'd see, see the same thing. Like you wouldn't be able to see that it's a circle. It would look like a straight line and you would look like a straight line. But from a three-dimensional perspective, you can see that's a circle and that's a square, right? So because we have not just length and width, we have height that we can look down on a 2D thing. So imagine trying to condense, you know, trying to be a two-dimensional being and perceive a three-dimensional being, right? We can only see very, very small parts. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Robert Bruce, uh, oh, here's, hold on. You got the Robert Bruce Energy. This is the book, Energy Work by Robert Bruce. It's another book that I recommend. Um, uh, it might seem like I recommend a lot of books, but compared to the number of books I own, I recommend very few of them. So happy birthday, and I'm glad you got that book. It's it's um, some of the best, most simple, but really, really powerful um, work on energy work that you can do. And I've done a lot of energy work because I come from a martial arts background. I've done Qigong and um, I've done yoga and all kinds of stuff. So I've done lots of energy work and um, teach energy work as well. So, um, but this is a really great, fantastic, accessible and unique. Like this guy came up with a very unique system for teaching energy work. So you'll have to let me know once once you've gone through for a while and done some of the practices, how that's working. Oh, here's Phoebe. Phoebe, how are we doing? She's like, you're not paying attention to me and I'm a cat and it's time. So I do have to wrap up here. I've got to uh, begin the rest of my day. Phoebes, come say hi. No, okay. <laughs> She's like, I make a brief appearance and then I'm off. Um, um, so yeah, I have a lot of a lot of naysayers here. These are cute ideas made to give a placebo effect. I don't know what that the I think you're misunderstanding what a placebo effect is, that there's something known on the other side. Um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, people coming on, and <laughs> I guess you get to see Phoebe's quick uh oh yeah, yeah, you'll have to let me know um what happens with fibromyalgia. Yeah, yeah, let me know. Uh, I want to hear for sure how this works out for you. Not having fibromyalgia, I, I don't I don't know how that would work out. But um, yeah, so somebody is being very, I would say, pejorative and closed-minded on the other side, and that's okay. I don't claim that anybody has to believe what I believe. 
Um, but, uh, you know, people are very confident in what they don't believe in. Um, and uh, I think being open-minded in, and even scientifically so is, is a really good thing, can be a really good thing. Um, but when you close your mind off to possibilities, um, you live in a very limited and impoverished belief system. So that can be, that can be very challenging. Um, you know, and you have to like, anything I don't believe in isn't real. Um, that's a really not a, not, not a, not a really good place to live your life from. Um, with that, I'm going to leave for the day. I got to get started with my day. The cat's reminding me that, uh, I got, I got things to do and bills to pay and, and, uh, but it's been nice chatting with you all. Um, what's life without curiosity? Exactly. What's life when you close down all options? Um, yeah, very limited. Um, but I don't, you know, people do not absolutely do not have to believe what I believe. Um, I don't expect that. I just present my my experiences and and my interpretations. Oh, thank you. well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me. Um, my love, I, I do when I say that, I mean it's like I love you all. I, I actually do. Um, uh, I am doing my best to always come from a place of love. I'm making a commitment to come from a place of love. Um, thank you very much. Well, I always enjoy your good mornings. You always are the first one on here to wish me a good morning. You're the first one to join, the first one on. So thank you for joining and I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody who has tuned in. And um, I will talk to you real soon. I'm gonna do, I'm trying to do several of these a week because um, I realize not everybody can catch these on all the times I do them. Although there's always a recording available. Um, there's a recording available on YouTube and a recording available on Facebook. So um, you can, if you're if you're on there, um, my Facebook page is, uh, I think it's called John Moore Shamanic Practitioner. And my YouTube channel is called Shaman's Tent. Um, so, because a lot of shamanic cultures use tents for what they do. So that's a shout out to shamanic cultures that use tent. Someday I want to own a yurt. Someday I'll own a yurt, um, you know, and I'll come to you. I'll have to have Wi-Fi in my yurt, though. <laughs> I'll come to you from inside my yurt. Love yurts. Um, with that, I'm going to leave you for the day. Uh, again, love you all. Um, have a great day. Um, hopefully see most of you later in the week.